Welcome. Uh, I'm Lise McLaughlin, the Director of Writing the Land Project, and speaking to you from the homelands of the Abenaki Elnu in Squawcake, also known as Northfield, Massachusetts, extending gratitude for the continued presence of these co-creators with the land here. Writingtheland.org is a project of nature culture that pairs poets with land trust protected lands and creates an anthology of poetry sold by the land trusts to support the mission of land protection. All the poets reading today have dedicated their time and effort to creating poems for the project. And this reading is a way for us to celebrate them and the releases of their own books which happened during 2020 and 2021. Uh, everyone who registered will receive a follow-up link to where the recording will be posted, as well as information about where you can purchase these authors' books. Uh, if we have time at the end, we will answer a few questions. So feel free to type them into the Q&A as we go along. I'm delighted to start off this celebration of Writing the Land Poets' own books with author Robert Carr. Thank you, Liz. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I am going to be starting with a poem uh, from uh, the Writing the Land Project, uh, which is um, my work with Higgins Mountain in central Maine. Um, the, my book is uh, titled The Unbuttoned Eye, um, which focuses on my experiences working in infectious disease and identity through the HIV pandemic. Um, it's been interesting to have a book uh, focused on poems about pandemic in the current uh, historic moment. Um, and I found that there have been a lot of parallels um, between the HIV pandemic and the COVID pandemic. Um, I also, in preparing for today's uh, reading, um, found a significant intersection of my work with natural imagery and personal history. And um, in that context of HIV AIDS, I've selected some of those poems to share with you. First, um, my poem, uh, which will be included in the upcoming Writing the Land anthology. Um, Higgins Mountain, without my father. I've come to liken loop to find the quiet in the cracks of my own face. Everything about this mountain split. Ageless granite wedged apart by ice, stone crowned by deep green pillows, boulders wrapped in blankets of British soldier. At the summit, I find deer scat on a bed of needle. I'm tired. The buck somewhere hidden in scrub brush, I touch the season of ground cover, lichen and moss, the final rift of fathers and their sons. And now a selection from the unbuttoned eye. Goose down terrors. A black knot twists under covers like someone I used to know. It's hard to swallow a beach stone tongue. Whatever's in my gut is counted in folds, mucous membrane, edgeless decades of dead that finally found their Robert. In the street lit room, I pace, panic through sheets of spider silk. It is the endless nothing I can't stop. God, take away this skin scratch. My dog, sleeping in the corner, stomps snakes after a third turn clockwise. There are no comforts in a language of twitch and dream. Repeated cries, high-pitched yips, don't amuse or calm. My eyelid has a tick to top that field mouse dream. Awake, I'm shaken, a fistful of hair still connected to silver scalp. I can't lie down in this disheveled bed where no one wakes. Sweated sheets wind in cold puddling, the shape of a sleepless body, goosed down terrors, drip damp, fluttering. A living thing shifts beneath a blanket. Speaking in flowers. 
Tonight, we'll share a breath of pollen, exhale toward the lunar language of this September. We'll whisper through the passing clouds as they stretch a pink vein between us. Starting today, we speak in the windpipe weight of amaranth, in the barbed legs of bees on daylilies, in the red checkerberry carpet of beads at the twiggy root of mountain laurel. Cut flowers. When I count daily 16 years between my age and my mother's age at death, is there something pushed from a, a soil brown eye, I'd like to say? Does the joy of breaking ground, planting bulbs on a newfound farm, split between a spring garden and a grave? Does my plan for a brindle puppy hinge on an empty dog bed, the old friend that breathes beneath a blanket beside me? I shake, repulsed to wonder if time has come for loved ones to leave me money. Am I missing something? Or is it just the stems of tulips standing in a glass cylinder, growing very fast, rootless, that startle? Petals as they pile on a mirrored table. Um, before entering my, my career in public health, I was a volunteer with the AIDS Action Committee um, and paired with, with um, um, men who were suffering from advanced HIV disease. And this is a description of that um, experience. 89 tears. Too young, buddy, I volunteered in corner rooms of stainless IV stands, sipped tall drinks of water through a straw, pretending swallows were uninfected tears. What entered the eye was upside down, the cryptococcal droppings of birds. When it got too ugly, spackle of cinder block mint green, yellow casings over fluorescent tubes, any sign to stare at. I left the exhales of great teachers in hallways of overcrowded zipper bags. They taught me decline in fast forward. I knew too much and no one, never carried flowers, though I noticed Robert's pale lilies, stems in cloudy water rolling on tray tables. I lost the names of mentors without trying, scholarly, silent, ageless, regardless of their age. Folded, pillowcases, monogrammed. While lovers said goodbye, I stood alone in hallways. I was a bony shoulder, the damp man too tender to be touched. I read messages on caked teeth, scraped candida letters from blank tongues. In my sleep, I heard the sound of zippers, tripped and stumbled over cast off leather, hoped that someday there would be a little rip to let me through. Please, just let me bury my face in your round of body, hum that muffled sound, the woodwind of marrow. Just let me arch in the crossed patterns of your hand. Bed making after the ER. If I hold this threadbare sheet just right, let hot breeze blow through my open window and become noonlight, I can almost feel the red locker room snap of a twisted towel on my hock, almost see the nude boy shock I cast. If I tuck hospital corners tight, I can almost believe there really is no wrinkle, no stain on the cover, my hand. We all fold into cotton. And the final poem from the collection, um, The Boat That Takes Me. 
blanket my body in the hull of a red canoe, lay its heavy head on a needle pillow of pine, suck the cold knob of Adam's apple, say goodbye, misting foot against a bone boat adrift in memory, a hand clutches the trim of a gun metal dock, silent trigger, not so hard to push off after all. And I'll close with um, a poem um, from a new collection that I'm working on. Um, my husband, Stephen, and I have been together for 33 years. And uh, I think this will be familiar to many people who've been in long-term relationships. I'm reminded of what I'm forgotten. Squirrels scatter nut chunks from the giant hickory tree above the drive. Walking the dog, you remind me of little things I've failed to do. I hold a braided lead. You slip on bitter shells. Could you sweep this up, you ask, have asked. It takes bristle to care for other than yourself. The oven heated to 350 after dinner's done. You want this on? Bedroom windows as we leave the house. You want these open? Back door unlocked the morning after I'm home late. Could you do something about that? I answer, apparently not. I've learned a few things over the years. The toilet seat is always down. The three ply paper over, not under. Lies have consequences. On our walk, you stoop to pick up shit. Fresh shaved head, spots of red on a fair scalp. I'll miss the reminders, Stephen. Please don't die. I have never brushed a bath. Nothing will be swept. Meals will burn. Wind and rain will pour through every opening in the house. Glass picture frames exploding in the hall. My bleeding fist. The sink filled with coffee mugs. Rot in the fridge. Even my body will smell different if you go. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Robert. Very powerful poems. Our next reader is Jesse Levasco. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, it's an honor to be reading with all these poets who are so dedicated to the land. And I wanna thank nature, culture and writing the land as well. I reside in two places. Michigan and Vermont, um, land of Anishinaabe and Abenaki, land of great water and land of green mountains. So my poems are from both places. The majority of the nature poems are really in, from Vermont and the other relationship type poems are more from Michigan. This is my book, Native. It was published by Homebound Publication and like all of us, we didn't have a chance to read them when they came out. I had 10 book readings and all of them were canceled. So this is an amazing opportunity and I thank you. I'm gonna start with the first poem and it's the longest poem. It's called First Immigrant. And I was inspired by a line uh, by the writer Clarissa Pinkola Estes. The line is, the soul is the first immigrant. Never born, I dwell in foreign landscape, flow with water the color of blood, sail shorelines of skin and bone, tread lightly on language of the ordinary in harmony with fire and stars. When recognized, all life gestures through my fingers. I am a stranger in a lonely land, a small stone, a golden sun. Usually it takes death to be noticed, the final fall, the last chance, the injury that changes all matter of things. How can I speak to you? I can't. I have no voice. You must look for me so that I can cross the border of mind into mythology perceived in the present. See me in another, the stallion, the bear, 
the ones who dance and sing, ones who orchestrate symphonies of astounding music, ones who walk the streets with grocery carts and sacks on their backs, looking for homes. Hunger opens. How deeply do you want to discover anything other than your own reflection? Be curious, have courage. You don't have to feed me. The gardens of the gods will be waiting. When the sky grows dark, the fires roar in the distance, the earth quakes or your life shape shifts into something unrecognizable, you'll see me. I'm standing where I always am amidst the rubble, upon a mountaintop, under an apple tree with you being. I also am an herbalist and um, I take very seriously the native peoples and all the work they did to create and find the medicines that we use today in herbal medicine. So this is in honor of them, keepers of medicine. Across mountains and plains with buffalo, prairie dog, snake, I must search for keepers of medicine, ask to use what they unearthed from blessed soil. Their labor with mud crusted hands cannot be measured. We have reaped the value of what they revealed in yellow duck, dandelion, and yarrow, the great medicines that heal. Risking death as they spoke to rain and thunder, sang praises to sun, flared in rash, burned and coughed up blood in order to understand. They gathered knowledge from each landscape and leaf, knowing when to use a flower, when to use a root, which ones were asking to be chosen, chopped, boiled, swallowed in a brew. Years of trials, the great task of listening through hunger, drought, and birthing children, they grew trust in the roots of autumn, spring blossoms, birds that move seeds through the air. This next poem is Holding the Bow. Indigenous ones, those who warm their hands in earth, know the cycle of moon and stories of constellations. Those who nourish each other with plants, ecstatic dance and sacred rituals, who guide their children to know nature, lead rites of passage with communities of trust. These are the ones to lead us. Their ways uphold tools for navigating a life well lived on this earth. Food, shelter, warmth, clothes, medicine, and honoring their people. Instead of the illusionary arrows of our bows, aiming farther away from the origin of what nurtures humanity. As my parents uh, started to grow old and I started to watch them and started to, I, I, I came upon autumn one year and said, wow, there's so many similarities. And so I put this together, the beauty of decay. I noticed the small changes in my aging parents. They laugh at each other. One can't find his hearing aid, the other can't bend down to tie her shoe. I see the change in the numbers of lines on their faces. They realize they are fading. Walking on back roads as the autumn sunlight fades, everything is burgundy, dark green, and gold. Where once plump cherries and apples hung, there are now shriveled and frozen spheres. I still see the parents I knew and who they've become. Forgetting what they said and legs that don't carry them as fast, still, I see beauty in their decay. Two old people holding hands, dancing in the kitchen to Sinatra 
and hanging on to the last fragments of life like wrinkled fruit on an old tree. I took care of um, my niece and nephew in New York City and we were at Central Park and this poem came. White egret. White egret glided over grasses, fiddlehead and fern, then landed as I was caring for young children by a pond. Angelic, her wingspan fanned its gentle wave across the shore and no one noticed. No one applauded or knelt upon the grass, but the children, eyes and mouths as round as moons, stopped and held her for that moment, watched as she preened her wings, leaving them one feather in the midst of spring green. And here is another uh, poem on birds. This is called Call of the Loons and I happen to have read an article and it's from the Vermont Loon Recovery Project and the line was, a loon sings its predecessor's call. A loon moving from one lake to another will change its call to match that of its new home. The landscape sings through the loon. The loon is the mouthpiece of the lake. So that is the inspiration for this. As we inhabit each pond and lake, we listen. Here, the original score of landscape and water emanating from groves of trees, seeping through ancient feathers and bones, a call we instinctively decode, one that hails from our throats, pierces the stars with our red eyes, haunts the night with our ebony heads. Each yodel, tremolo, and wail belong to no other. We hold a terroir of instinctual sound. It drops from our tongues like rain. And I am the oldest of 10 children and I always loved to write and, um, and I'm an artist as well. And I would definitely hide and get away from them in my basement, in my closet, because there was always a lot of chaos and noise. It was wonderful, but I had to um, take some time alone. So this is like my last poem, I believe. Horse. Silence was a wilderness in a house of many children. I ran like a wild horse with the sound of ocean waves crashing against the shore. I locked my bedroom door and sat in my closet writing. Pen and paper, my bow and arrow, I was inspired by the only landscape I knew, the open page. Found myself bareback, exuberant, galloping over the inner worlds of thought shaping them into words on paper, gathering them into a corral of poems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse, for those grounded poems. Our next reader is Mike Bove. Hi, everyone. Just wanna echo the the previous poets in there, thanks for, for Lisa and to all of you for coming out to listen to poetry today. I'm Mike Bove and I'm reading from uh, my hometown, Portland, Maine, which uh, is where I was born and raised. It's also a place that was settled on the traditional territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy. And the current tribes who uh, comprise the Wabanaki Confederacy are the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, the Maliseet, and the Mi'kmaq. And I'm going to read from my new book today. I'll show it to you here. It's called House Museum. 
it's pretty tricky to uh, have a book come out in the pandemic. Of course, we all <laughs> know that. And so thanks again for this opportunity to read from the book. And my book, House Museum, grew out of a fascination that I have with place, how we move through physical and non-physical structures and landscapes. And while we're doing that, we move through all of the people and beings who have moved through there before us and will move through there after us. And so I'm going to begin just by reading the, the epigraph that I have for my book, which is by um, Henry Longfellow, who's a, a poet who's also born in Portland. And this is a, a short stanza from his poem, Haunted Houses. All houses wherein men have lived and died are haunted houses. Through the open doors, the harmless phantoms on their errands glide with feet that make no sound upon the floors. And I, I love that idea of uh, sort of cohabiting with uh, invisible people. And so I'm going to start with um, a poem that is called House Museum. It's the title poem of my collection. Oh, by the way, I think it's important for us to know what we're getting into. So I'm gonna read five poems for you. Two of them are short, one of them is kind of long and the other two are sort of medium. So this is House Museum. We'll walk through your house. Yes, and look through your rooms. We'll drape our gaze all over your kitchen things, your velvet stool. We'll see where you held your children and argued over money. We'll snicker at your grandmother's portrait and sigh relief that we don't have to use your privy. You might catch wind of us in a tickle on your neck, a burning in your ears. You might call out to us in dreams, but please don't bear your secrets. We're tourists in your troubles on vacation from our own. We're just so far removed, you see, and only passing through. In this book, I write a lot about my children and their experiences in and around our home. And this is a poem that grew out of that. We don't know for sure where your fear of snakes came from. But the time you stepped on one in the woods and afterward shook a long time in your mother's arms stays fresh like the day of, like the first day of summer, the same day it happened. The colors bright in your head when you told us that yellow in the stripes and leafy green, how it writhed beneath your sandaled foot and flipped its tail to catch bare toe. We don't know for sure where your fear of snakes came from, but we remember you coiled in your mother's arms, your sudden terror and something wild striking away from us into darkness. The next poem I'll read is a poem uh, about my, my father who died uh, just before the pandemic started. And a lot of the poems in this book explore the spaces that I um, inhabited with him both while he was living and then afterward um, in his death. This one uh, is called Standing in Riverton Field. May breeze is such comfort that I don't wanna remember my dad in a mechanical bed in the emergency room hallway where the doctor listened to his rambling, asked him to draw the face of a clock and told me his episode was nothing but the natural precipitous drop of worsening dementia. Instead, I'll keep the sudden clarity when he used my son's name, looked up at me and said, when you see him playing baseball, it's all you'll ever need. The breeze pulls the mayflies, ghosts in the sun, and beyond them, practicing with his team, my son catches a pop fly in a splendid dive. I'm going to do just two more. And I would like to read for you one that's not in the book. I'm going to read a new one. 
And this one is called Wildfire Sunsets. I used to think I was good with change, adaptable and flexible, but a big storm has me keeping an eye on the creek. If it rises too far past the stone wall, the basement will flood again. I'm older now, I'm getting tired. I'm breathing smoke from another fire out west. I can't remember all their names, but while they burn, they make the sunsets on this end of the country look radiant. The light reaches everywhere. That's no claim to a silver lining, only a comment on the way things are now. This is the way things are. My boys grow up in this world, and in my heart, I have apologies. The light reaches that too. In my last poem, I'm going to uh, read and dedicate to all the poets who are here reading. And I suspect we have maybe a few in the audience as well. So I'm gonna read one for you. Um, this is a poem called The Poems You Like. And I wrote this poem after a particularly frustrating period of submitting and then collecting rejections. And as you know, some of those rejections come back very strange. In particular, I can remember a few that say something like, we really like these poems, but we're not going to publish them. And we'd like to see more of things like this, but not these. And it becomes, you know, so confusing and frustrating. And so I ended up uh, doing a writing exercise that came out of that frustration, sort of a tongue in cheek kind of sarcastic thing. But at the end of it, the poem that came out of it, I really liked. And I ended up sending it out and it got snatched up the first place that I sent it. So it was this kind of funny thing that happens to us, right? We never know who's on the other end reading our work when we submit. So this is called The Poems You Like. All begin mid-sentence with a cool edge tumbling inward toward a vermilion core. They possess images, they make images, and many of them are quite striking due to the disavowal of standard punctuation with the exception of instances of extreme emphasis or necessity. Your grandmother's pain lives inside them along her mahogany shelves next to a framed photograph of a dead soldier. And the window is open because the poem must have a question, but in place of an answer, there is the wind. You hear angry fathers in the lines and see vast expanses of ice on January lakes off the back roads leading to a city of great joy and a love which someone you know has left buried beneath the big oak in the park. All the poems you like feature a sunflower. All the poems you like are flapping like maple leaves and in them your old pets have come back to life and so has Miles Davis. Please don't forget the burnished sun and the russet fields, that steamy vermilion core. Please don't forget that all the poems you like end with this and this or this. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for those very likable poems. <laughs> Our next reader is Alice Fogel. Hi, everybody. I want to um, just add my voice to all of the thanks to um, all the writers that are here and, and Lise and the whole Nature Culture program, which is just wonderful. Um, I'm going to try sharing my screen with you at one point, but um, for, for this beginning part, I think I'll just tell you a little bit about me and um, read one of the poems that I wrote for my piece of land that I honored, um, got honored by um, being able to write about and go to. So um, I'm the former poet laureate of New Hampshire, and I'm going to talk about my latest book, Nothing But, which is my um, sixth book of poems. Um, I also wrote a book called Strange Terrain, which is a how-to guide to appreciating poetry, even 
if you don't get it. Um, I really like writing series of poems um, that have a, a specific structure and theme. So I wrote um, a book of poems based on Box Goldberg variations and um, another one called A Doubtful House, which is um, from the point of view of a house speaking to its inhabitants and uh, hoping that they get their act together, which they don't. Um, and um, before, and so this, this one I'll tell you about in a minute, but before that, most of my poems were very nature-based. Um, and I am getting back to that at this point too. Um, so the poems, um, the place that I wrote about for nature culture um, was Thorndike Pond, Whittemore Island in Thorndike Pond in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. Um, I had to wait for the uh, spring to come so I could get out to it in a kayak. Um, there's three poems in the series for this piece of land. Um, one of them is for the horizons, one's for the water, and one is for the ground, and I'm gonna read you the one for the ground. With the great angles of the mountain just beyond the horizon, the height of the white pines and hemlocks bearing sky, and the circle of land around the lakeside's distance, it's the spring ground I'm drawn to peer at most. It's moss muted echo of new maple leaves green. It's deep golden lichen of fake fox fur, the fallen and dried cones and catkins sprinkling soil into a texture akin to the flakes of bark on trunks, or like the small crisscrossings of waves that moat the shores. Here at my feet sink all the old beaches cool shades of browns and tans and grays as last year's leaves age into earth and fresh sprouts arise bright and lean into the tripleted forms of trillium, the starbursts of sweet woodruff, red seeds dropped and strewn and growing through blown down branches, all the piled plenty of loss left of the past, all the tiniest hints and most insistent hedged bets of the future. So the new book is called Nothing But, a series of indirect considerations on art and consciousness. Um, I don't know if you can really get a look at this art. Each of the poems in this book um, is inspired by um, an individual piece of abstract expressionist art, um, which I love because of the way that it interrupts our stream of consciousness and makes our um, inner chatter just stop for a minute and lets our minds kind of open up to this um, unknown, which, um, so to me, abstract expressionist art is not non-representational. It just doesn't represent the realities that most of us are in all day long and think about most of the day. It represents something um, that our consciousness can fragment in, and open up to a deeper spirit to break through. So um, I am going to share my screen here so you can see what the poems look like on the page as they're um, representing um, the paintings. They're not describing the paintings, they're just inspired by them. Let's see if I can get this right. So first I just wanna sh um, read this quote to you that's above the poem and then I'll line up the poem better. Can everybody see the, the page? Okay, great. Um, so this quote by William Jane, James from the Stream of Consciousness, 1892. Consciousness is in constant change, a series of indirect considerations. The only breaches that can well be conceived to occur within the limits of a single mind would be interruptions, time gaps, during which the consciousness went out. You'll see the, um, 
my titles tend to kind of play off of the titles of the artwork. Um, if you're interested you, to try to find some of the artwork that the um, artists and their works titles are right there. Notes for 59. When we were wordless, waving and green, taken in like an orphan, when we were held back from loving, from attraction to the line, the only division, a need for insight. When we came alive after the rain's glaze and saw in white clouds a black mountain and in the sea an inkling that refused to reflect with accuracy the predictable elements. Or when we didn't see but knew not with the fact but by the leap of paint, the pigment of mineral knowing we were drawn to and could not take our eyes off, even as they blinked and swept sidelong and inward to find more imaginable worlds beyond the given frame. It would have been easy to say, ooh, landscape, to say wave and sky, or oh, oh, horizon, and feel it as a thought that we had been here before. But this time, without argument, without dissembling over a line, and with what perspective, with what indication of distance or foreground, of what foreshadowed afterthought. Um, I can't get the frame to show the whole thing. I'll just have to move it. Um, so this one, most of the time, I would not pick a painting to work with if I could look at it and say, oh, that looks like a mountain or, oh, that looks like a fish. I, I didn't want it to look like anything to me other than just texture and color and light and um, something that got dug up out of the ground or something maybe from the cosmos. Um, this particular painting, which was an abstract, expressionist piece of art had this title, Garden Farm Road. And so I almost didn't take it because it was just way too descriptive and way too instructive. So I was kind of mad at it for limiting my view of what I was seeing um, by giving it that title, Garden Farm Road. So part of the, the poem kind of opens with a bit of an argument against that. There from here. But does it go anywhere else? Oh, if only you hadn't told us. But whatever, the road we took to get here, it's gone now, dehissed like a surgical wound in the otherwise lovely flesh. We wanted so much to forget about this, to break it instead to you in a Zeno's paradox, always having the distance no matter the never getting there, no matter what, where we can never go back. It's that future we most miss. We wish we hadn't read the report or the name that we could just go on living in the brightened silence that islands vernal into the instant between knowing what's coming down the road and the coming of it. Once what was once, a lifetime away, the initial destiny carved seemingly into bark is here now. A broken window become first a fountain of glass, next second a shrine, soon the light after rain. And then what we dread, all of a sudden, it could be happening all in one mind. We're not sure which one or one mind could happen to it or you either way. I'll just read one more. This one is called Full of Life um, and it's from Megan Chapman's painting called Pocket Full of Live Wire Wires. When we say, when I leave this earth, we mean when I leave this place I am and try to find anywhere 
where there are no unmarked graves. We keep thinking we're seeing where maybe there are none, shades of condensation, the old horizontals where fresh verticals of dirt scrape away to granite and glare, a kind of feral dusting of lichen coats the history of the ones buried in a hurry and left. Now we can't help but doubt and double back, make new assumptions about old assumptions, take on purpose everything personally, and then we just want to cry. If we knew what makes us conscious, if it was of Adam or of Adam, if particle or God, would that change our minds? Every time we try, we try to give up the ghost of gravity. We get so unbalanced, we're ashamed. And what are our options? Go down under hummus like a seed or be lifted into air by heat? We're afraid to tilt beyond the painted limits of the frame. We have a feeling we are the frame. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice, for these artistic poems. Our next reader is Suzanne Rancourt. OK. I am coming to you from Mohawk Territory, southern Adirondacks, up from the Sakandaga. I was born and raised in West Central Maine, which of course was Abenaki territory. And well, I find myself living in an equally rural mountainous area. They have a funny accent here though. The land that I got to spend time on was the Down East Salmon Federation out at Boar's Nest. <clears throat> Those poems are still mulling and in work. It was great. So thanks to all for making this possible. Little birds. They jump rope with an umbilical cord and chant with each skip. Red bird sings in the morning, red bird awakens me. The ever watching shawl draped grandmas peer deep between the dialogue of lowered eyes and lustful glance and watch. Little girls no more, their seed pod bellies swell like breasts of birds into nests glitter dreams glass birds do weave and songs red bird sings in the morning in the morning let down your voluptuous raindrop seed pearl notes from it waters heaven moisten my heart i pray for rain tip back my bird head i scry the sun, words are not enough. I forgot how to sing. So I'm, my uh, indigenous ancestry is the Abenaki and Huron. But in case you haven't noticed, I got thin lips and I'm a wee light complected. So to honor all my ancestors, I'm not standing up so you can't see that I got a flat pancake, pancake ass. So, I, you, you know, that's the way it is. Sorry, Lise, this is who you get. I honor all my ancestors, Scottish. Clearly there's English, but there's also Middle Eastern. There's also indigenous. We're all indigenous from somewhere. So I am grateful that the land here allows me to reside here and share beauty. I'm also a veteran. 
Marine Corps as well as Army and most recent time in was 05 to 08. I know I only look 24, but I'm really 36. Tsunami conflict. From a beach in Vietnam, a young soldier plucked a shell, the remains of a white shell, a spiraled nautilus breast-shaped round shell that he carried back to the jungle of night's death, surrealty of rotting flesh, a camaraderie of confusion. The soldier's thumb fits into the underside of curves and topical ridges, an inverted nipple, a confluence of politics, a paradox of ethics that he carries in his rucksack and M16. An old man, an old woman, the soldier, the shell, children, gains, losses, washing across beaches, his thumb still in the shell, still tracing the topography of survival. The boy in the water, witness. The boy, like water tumbling to a puddled stop for wind to quiver its surface, his brown hand extended across the top of many hands to a man he had never met, who received with palm turned sunward toward the source, Alalin, the milk of many, and this hand that received across the valley of differences recognized the water in the water. I heard the echo. I heard the whisper called a gesture. Same, same. Our skin the same color. And I recall the moment. A Lakota man in Vietnam tightened his grip on an M16. A grandma runs from a hut and pleads, same, same, his hand touching his. Mediterranean Blues. The baby is a pool toy washed up by the surf. A red, yellow, blue beach ball baby. Half deflated, face down. The inevitable tide nuzzles, teases the suppleness of thick black toddler hair rocks its ebb and flow there in wet sand of sodden hope. It's like wind, perhaps, or a mother's breath that puffs a stinging insect away, or the quick pulse of fingertips that brush away sticky crumbs from a morning shirt from breakfast's past. Family and a promise of a future, like any family on any beach plucking shells from squawking gulls. Where are we in this violent eddy of riptides and terror? Who are we as humans awash with technology and fanaticism? We are adrift. We are adrift. So from Old Stone's New Roads, I'll read a few poems here. And I have to give thanks to various 
journalists. I can't remember who they were. Something about the word unhinged. Unhinged again. A stone leaves the hand that flung it. Air escapes constricted. Vocal cords of vomiting wild, enraged urgency and angst. Kinetic makes contact, leaves bruises the color of bludgeoned, fists pounding, flesh is quiet. I can't remember if I was screaming. My face and shielding hands turned over ripe plum purple, sweet with sticky juice that dribbles down chins, attracts sugar bees that you swat in autumn sun, that smells of maple leaves red with change. This hammer drives the firing pin into a child's memory, my memory. Cap guns explode a thousand times greater than a simple pop and puff. A chunk of lead propelled is unhinged from the mansplaining, the antagonistic prod of condescending joust. I was stuck in a ring of double-fisted doubts. Leave, don't leave. I didn't know that I was a prisoner of white picket conditions, like my mother. Was she also a prisoner? A sidebar of recollection, a nursery rhyme my mother sang to me, Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, had a wife and couldn't keep her. He put her in a pumpkin shell, and there he kept her very well. I know my mother knew when I was being beaten. There my face laying with one ear pressed to cold linoleum, the other an upward funnel catching my mother's vengeful whisper, get up, get up, fight. To be marginalized, a side note or comment placed in the periphery only seen when the reader desires or deems worthy of notice. Only one of us walked out from that house that day to be silenced. A voice, a room, a home, a door closed upon it. A mind made up, barred entrance, not worth the time to view, hear, acknowledge. I'm writing this and telling you words are a privilege. Voice is a human right, thrown as stones. They fall from the wind. Get up. I probably should have gave a content warning with some of those. Sorry. I am always inspired by my ancestors and traveling because wherever we go, we're from. So, you know, coming from a family of dowsers, wherever we put our feet, we're from, we feel. And that's what I love about writing the land project. It gives us an opportunity to do that and to give voice to that which perhaps may never have been the, given the opportunity. We have a responsibility as artists, and it doesn't matter our modality. Voyage. The hawthorn tree does grow in blight with raven's caw, iridescent light. Bones of ancients praise the night. Ships sail. Ships sail. A 20-minute memory. A subway station just outside of London. A cup of coffee. A Welch man with stark white hair. 
eyes celestine blue. I say, if I had a secret boat, it would sail quietly in a sea of solitude like in Meme's paintings. I would slip across cold waters to warm shores, archetypical images of real lives, hard ships fossilized in the caves of Inchnadamp rumbling in the hollow rib cage of the oldest known cave bear skeleton. Sing through waters of springs and brooks that vanish into hillsides, emerge clean on the other side, the meadow of stags. Like the iridescence of raven feathers found by the hawthorn tree gnarled by time, and the marching clans that returned from ocean expeditions sailed into Ullapool like seals whipped inland up through waterways into locks to the Dolomite caves, bone caves, just beyond the tree, but not before offerings are made. My vessel, a spiral of DNA, tree roots of twists and twirls, braids me with the Norse moors of Scotland, hard people seeking warm water, white sand beaches, palm trees, at the edge of the world in Achmelvik, where some must go backward to go forward. I would go there again, as my ancestors travel Gulf Stream waters to New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, where the red paint people curled into the shape of an ear, to the earth we listen, as our ochre painted bodies, our blood painted bodies, return to life. Suzanne, you probably have time for one more. Okie dokie. Well, okay. So, present, future. We have past, present, future. And I'm delighted to share with you that this manuscript, Songs of Archilochus, just signed a contract for that, so more on that later. The rain after the rain is the wind. This wind shoulder bumps stack droplets like boxes. They tumble down branches, fall off cliff tips shining green with wet. Trees can shiver even in the aspirate and diaphanous humidity, a sigh into quick sweet water rinse. Refreshed is the moment I loved most, crisp skin washed by ceremony and light. Forgiveness doesn't come easy in the hollows lined with grief, entombed in wells naivete riddled. How do any of us move on beyond distance? Presence. Inside these raindrops, inside myself, inside the tree, the red cloth tobacco songs seep between weave, aroma, rising steam, rising forgiveness, rising. I've never understood my need for distance. And there I was in Mongolia, whole and soaring. Thank you, Suzanne, for those wonderful story poems. Our next reader is Catherine Hagopian Berry. Thank you, Lise. 
Thank you, Reading the Land and Nature Culture. Um, I come to you from land cherished by the Abenaki, Wabanaki, and Pequawket people, otherwise known as Bridgeton, Maine. Um, and I have the enormous privilege of going far enough in this reading that I get to come in and pick up some threads. So in honor of what Suzanne was saying about your own roots, I'd like to begin with a poem called Inheritance. Uh, tracing my roots, which are, of course, a glorious mess, but in this poem, uh, honoring an Armenian and Jewish heritage. Inheritance. My great-great-grandmother was the wise woman. Stop. Listen. My great-great-grandmother was the wise woman. She lived under a mountain dappled with bones. She named her daughters for stars. Listen. On the back of morning blinding, they rolled away the rock and she spoke. She spoke. I would pull skin back lovingly over those bones so she could speak to me. I would come to her across the pines and cedars follow the path of every pendant star. I would brush each white hair, pin her scarf close. I would become this inheritance. My great-great-grandmother was the wise woman. Stop, listen. My great-great-grandmother was the wise woman. Her village is lost under the ocean, under the mountain. We have forgotten the way across the pines and cedar. We have forgotten the shape of her hands. We have only this. She was the wise woman. Listen, we know this. She was, she, she was. Enter providence of sewing machines. My grandmother had already found her secret of letting out and taking in. Like an old blouse, languages faded and then dreams. Beans and red sauce swimming like fingers taken by Turks that school she would have opened to such intensity of sky. Instead, the Alexander left Istanbul, 300 male order brides, and all the way to Marseille, she never once looked back until she caught herself speaking French and a fresh voice answered her. There was only that one October night, field green behind the hospital. She didn't need a photograph. Every curve of her lip remembered how she lay on her back and counted every single star, how she noticed finally that they shone. Now, I teach my mother how to read fortunes. On a silk scarf I stole from her, the color of bone and new mown grass, blood and autumn sky. She used to wear it with a red gypsy skirt, pretend to read our palms in Halloween dark. Now the question of what moves me, holding my bitten nails over the future, smiling my aunt's smile. I want to say, these secrets were meant to be intimate, heard in your voice, the smell of earth turning, hay bales propped like unsteady children in the field. I want to say, this is how it should go, petaled like a star, thinking she should have known these things. She should remember, she should be teaching me. So like everyone else, I was um, delighted and overwhelmed and humbled to publish a collection. Mine's called Math Gear. But it happened during the pandemic. So things went a little differently than I had originally planned. Um, one of the things that happened as I assembled Math Gear is I noticed how intimately connected the poems in the manuscript were to the seasons that passed during uh, 2019. And I didn't realize how suddenly precious a lot of these moments would be until we landed where we are now. One of those moments was actually very much a writing the land moment. Um, as you know, we're paired with land trust and this poem actually comes from my current land trust land, not the land I'm writing on for the newest anthology, but um, a small little uh, set of trails along the Crooked River, but it's also part of the Loon Echo Land Trust. And back in the day when kids took field trips, my daughter and her classmates took a field trip to the Crooked River. 
And it was fascinating because all around us were these cedar waxwing birds. And they are birds which help each other. They function in groups to pass fruit from the edge of a branch all the way down to the smallest bird that's there so everyone can eat. And I thought that was a really interesting model watching kids cooperate on a field trip. Field trip, Crooked River. Waxwing, silk tail. What you eat becomes your color. Gorging on honeysuckle, hover over graph paper, berries and lines, plumbing this river crooked on boulders. We are distracted by your wingtips, very bright. On the branch you line up, one after the other, pass fruit until all are full. On the bank riparian children return to point out strong stones, hand over hand, until even the smallest has crossed eddy and wave and the egg of the sky. I'm going to slip one in for Mike because I too am fascinated by what goes on in houses. And I had the privilege of living in a very, very old one for a while. Um, and of course you have to wonder what is in your old house if you have one. Uh, in New England, the answer to that question is a whole lot and it's often crazy. Um, I don't know for sure what was in the house we lived in, but I will say whatever had lived there before us was gentle, kind, and very loving. But of course it got me to wonder. So this poem is called Homebody. And it's prompted by a joke my children just adored, which was a little gingerbread man saying, wait a minute, am I made of house? Or is the house made of me? So that launched the poem. You ask, is the gingerbread man made of house or is the house flesh? Gutter, shutter, common rafter, collar beam and corner post, girder, plaster, rough head, sill, timber, limbic, all nailed together, thresholds and nosings, sharp dental, deep soffit, gentle curve of a lunette, like a half-lidded eye. Gingerbread houses are always shaped like cabins. As winter comes silvering the lake and pinking sky, limb each pane in fractals, glorious with ice. You build them on paper plates, put M&Ms in order line by line to show the path we take across the snow. Inside, you place a man made out of Tootsie Rolls and bubble gum. Sometimes you pretend he is the lamppost, like the one in front of our old house, unstable. We would press the switch in telegraph meter, place bets if it would finally turn on. Maybe all houses have their codes and secrets, passages and hidden sounds. These days, we no longer drop bodies under floorboards, press them into walls, squared rubble brought to course, basements paved with catacomb bone, and yet, how comforting to have them there. Shedding into rooted cellars, rising up between the deep pine floors, fabricated dust to halo, each newborn light. One of the issues with writing the land, um, especially here in New England, is that sometimes your land is in a lot of pain. Um, and again, I'm going to read you a poem from my book, which happened before the Writing the Land Project, but it's about the Saco River, which I've had a really interesting relationship with ever since I moved here. Um, my husband wanted us to consider Bitterford Saco, and I remember driving over the Saco River, and I was like, hoo hoo, no thanks. And I didn't know why. Um, and I don't know, something prompted me to Google it. And it turns out the Saco River is deeply, profoundly, and I'm going to probably go with maybe eternally cursed. The stories differ. Um, they all center on a tremendous act of violence done to uh, a group of indigenous Abenaki people. Uh, looks, And again, like I've read about six different versions of the story and each one is slightly different. So I don't wanna to presume to know. Um, what we do know is that um, colonizers of one kind or another brutally murdered uh, at least three people in the tribe, uh, all of whom 
were in the family of the local tribal leaders and they cursed the river to claim three white lives in return. So when I learned about this, I started going, I started feeling this poem. And of course I went, well, how on earth do I write about this? I'm not Abenaki. Um, and as I did more research, I realized that it turns out on the site that this happened or one of the presumed sites that this happened, uh, it turned into a giant exploitative factory as one does in New England. And it employed a bunch of refugee Albanian girls, uh, many of whom became suicidally depressed and ended up killing themselves at the same site. And to me, I don't know why, but that just sort of felt like, wow, that's my ancestry. Like, the, I'm not Albanian per se, but like my whole American story was refugee women working in factories. And I was like, it just feels like maybe they're asking me to talk about it. The final piece of the puzzle, this is one of those poems with a long introduction, I'm sorry about it. Um, the final piece of the puzzle is of course the name of the factory, which was of course the Laconia Company. And I couldn't resist the pun because of course, being laconic is all about repressing things and holding things in. So the poem is called Sako Laconic. Sako, haunted river is hungry still for gray bones and slub nailed feet sturdy enough to walk over history, pretend it no longer matters, yet it takes a toll. Canoeing accidents, lost camper, a ranger or two, and suddenly belly full, angry water settles into winter, appeased perhaps for another season, or just frozen, seething under its prison of ice. Driving through Biddeford always made me uneasy, even before I knew the story, how they took sun, daughter and fed them to the river and the nameless child died silent and the nameless wife screamed silent and the father left only his curse. An easy enough thing to dismiss when there are iron tools and new boots to roll through great machines, feed our hunger for excess. But I wonder if shoes crumbled too easily, iron withered from rust in the dye rooms, in the cisterns, chemical echo, in the empty smoking room, cafeteria dishes crumbling, yellowed air hangs smug over all the lost. And then there are those stories of Albanian girls sensitive to ghosts who would wander over to Sako Island, Cuts Island, blood red, blood dark, murder island, and plunge, plunge, plunge themselves in. Dark hair on the water, her dark hair on the water, tiny feet in the water, cold fingers in the water. Easier perhaps to forget Abenaki, easier perhaps to become the Laconia Company, easier not to speak of it at all. Not wanting to end on that note, um, the title for my book comes from another natural phenomenon known as a mast year, which is what occurs when oak trees, for some reason, and actually they still don't quite know, in a given region somehow communicate with each other and they all simultaneously overproduce acorns, which sets off a wide scale population boom. So more acorns, more squirrels, more predators, and so forth. Uh, so it represents a season of unexpected and unknowable abundance. This book was the result of a complete mass year in my life and the past couple of years have not felt particularly abundant. So I offer you this last poem in the hope that this coming year will be a mass year for you. Mass year. Acorns, we hold one thing inside another. Selves we have put to rest, treasures we gather, antler, feather, black mica, sacred stone. Now the world wakes, sail-tailed squirrels, arc circles in the median, an orgy of population, acorn explosion, everywhere fruiting, you plant them in the sandbox, under the swing, seed, all deserts grove. So bodies pile up their fatness and their hoard. So the sun dips below the oak tree, the one that bends over my garden. I track its shadow, 
trying to absolve it from blame. But we are all guilty, it seems, of taking advantage of abundance. The warm spring calls the flower. The flower brings the fruit. The fruit falls, a carpet of sweetness, on the pine needles, on the dust dirt road, and we all scurry to taste. Wise crow waiting, rats flooding the yellow field, even our unlucky bodies belly full, even our oldest trees shake forth life. Root whispering, feathery hand on feathery hand. Now is our time. Thank you, Catherine, for those richly detailed poems. Our last reader is Anne Day. There we go. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I get to um, say how wonderful all the poems were because um, can I get rid of this? How do I get rid of this? Anyway, okay. <laughs> um, so um, thanks for all the great poems and it's a privilege to be here. Um, a special gratitude to Liz um, for her constant, um, for her, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> constant encouragement and support. I'm honored really to be part of this group and project. I was born in 1929, a little while ago, um, the oldest of five girls. Our parents had us all outside, you know, from day one practically. Um, and there was so many, in fact, when I was a baby, I was put outside in a bassinet on a porch for my nap, even in the winter. So I was well acclimated to being outside, plus the fact that there were all my younger sisters were um, bothersome lots of times. So I would go by myself into the woods and started writing poetry when I was probably in first grade. Um, <clears throat> um, I married Frank Day in 1950. Um, after two children were born and we traveled quite a bit. I was born in Boston. We um, moved, <clears throat> um, bought and moved into a farm in 1957. So this farm had been farmed since 1803 um, when settlers from Canada, French Canadians came down and started the farm. Some people had it in the 20s and 30s, um, took guests and called it Knoll Farm because it's on a knoll. <clears throat> um, so we've kept that name right along. And um, I live in Peterborough, New Hampshire now, and um, which I really, I can't tell you, I was on the farm for 60 years and um, I really, really miss it. So don't ask me how I got down here. <laughs> but by being here, I was able to join the Monadnock um, Conservancy and um, wrote poems for the first, first book. And one of them that's going to be in there is Beech Leaves. A lot of my poems are about nature. And also a lot of them have pictures. Most of them have pictures because I put together um, Things with pictures. So um, I'm just going to show this. Beach leaves. Why do the pale bronze leaves of beach betray the legacy of fall by holding fast to stubborn twigs beyond the time of autumn's call? For winter winds and storms they cling, reluctant to let go until the gentle touch of spring drops them awash in melting snow. I see them in the winter woods, a yellow patch in barren trees. Their parchment curls are clustered near and quiver in the cold north breeze. Perhaps 
I cling too much to seasons past and seasons seen, for spring will come with bursts of buds to fill a waiting world with green. Um, so that's enough pictures. <laughs> On our farm, there's a sometimes brook that's only there when you look at certain times of the year. Lost beneath the snow and icy slumber, it's like a circus tumbler with, <clears throat> with wintry laughter we're glad to hear. It winds the fields with a silvery thread and then is lost in autumn's stead out of stillness in the leafy nook. At last, November's snow and rain brings again the sweet refrain of our erratic, sometimes brook. This is all part of a <laughs> slide program that I had to show our guests we took guests for 50 years at the farm, and um, um, some that came to skiers in the wintertime because it was near Mad River and Sugarbush. Um, and so they wondered what it was like in the summer. So I wrote poems about that. Wild strawberry jam. A half pint jar holds tight the captured scent of last July. It waits upon the highest shelf behind my pantry door. When winter winds hurl snow across the frozen hillside slope, I'll make some toast and reach to take it down. The lifted lid will usher forth a burst of summertime, the drone of bees and buttercups stirring through the field where I plucked those warm wild berries into my cup. I went to kitchen, then will hold the fragrant fume of summer sun. Um, I did come out with a book, but this was quite a while ago, 2004. Um, and it has, it's a compilation of, because I've been writing um, for the Valley Reporter um, <clears throat> in the Mad River Valley uh, for since um, 1972, I think. So that's quite a while. And it's a lot of, a lot of articles and a lot of poems. So, um, one article that was in, in this one was a story about the tamarack tree called the golden tree. And this is a poem that went along with the story. In time, pyramid tree with pointed top, in warmest months, you're overwhelmed with green in the tangle of naked trees. You're hardly ever seen but now in the big in between, you shine against the graying hills. Each golden needle still clinging on catches narrow sunlight that spills sparsely from November's sky. Sometimes it seems that we forget, but like an unexpected guest, the glowing tamarack sings gloriously out of tune with all the rest. So, um, most of this sold out. Um, I had uh, 800 were printed um, by the Valley Reporter, is the publisher. Um, just to emphasize my, <laughs> my uh, attachment to nature, as trees um, just mean so much to me um, when one comes down that I've it's been a friend, it's, it's hard. But this is called I Am the Marsh, and it's meant to be read aloud. I am the glow of aspen, bronze green birch, blush of sunlit grasses in far distant field. I am the jade pines casting silent shadows across tawny reds and orange of Fenmac field reeds. I am lagoon, lagoon, lagoon of the bullfrog. A cree, a cree of the red winged blackbird, swamp sparrow's sweet song. I won't be able to do this. <laughs> Whistle. <laughs> See? Raven's guttural crawl. Crawl, 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 crawl. I am the rustle of the breeze. 
stirring gold and autumn leaves, in afternoon light that touches meadow rushes. I am the raccoon stalking a bowl, mud turtle on a log, ooze and sucking. I have to be standing. Muck. Sucking mud fills my nostrils, swallow my tongue, it says, and <laughs> suck in the cheeks. <laughs> I am the sky blue that inverts the stream, where reflections deepen into dreams of places I have not might have been, or perhaps I will go. So that's I am in Marsh. Okay. Um, sometimes put, excuse me, I didn't put these out of the way. Rhythm of the forest. We walk the old logging road high along the forest's eastern slope as spring's morning sun slants through the leafless trees of maple, beech, oak, butternut, still tight budded in April's icy nights and early morning fogs. The forest floor warms under last year's old leaves as violets, spring beauties, trout lilies, and Dutchman's breeches bloom along the old road where we pause to breathe in the miracle of newness from the old. In the late spring, the flowers will have begun to fade. Fruits and seeds form on the stems. Grouse, deer, and mice feed on berries and stems. When, when we return, the blossoms have wilted and begun their return into the ground. Again in June, we walk in the shadows of the unfurled hardwood leaves, while in the ground, the spring plants absorb the energy and grow into blossoms again in April. These ephemeral plants in rhythm with the forest trees. I have always had trouble with ephemeral. I hope I said it right. <laughs> Me. Um, we were very lucky because poetry was big at No Farm. And we had poetry workshops and people that came and stayed for a week and worked on poems in the big barn and up on the field. Um, <clears throat> so I had a friend from Time, Time Life came and um, in the um, uh, 19, July, 1970, um, when my husband had passed away, we had readings in the in the barn at Knoll Farm. And someone um, from Time, as I said, came, someone from Time Life. And so it was in, um, in the, I lost the thing, but anyway, it was between Sputnik and birth control. Oh, Sputnik and birth control on the nation's page. Um, and so she um, decided to do the poem that won for a prize that, that year in the barn. And it's called, um, it's, it's called, um, I'm sorry, I had this all together. I don't think I can read that. Um, print. That's okay, Anne. Just take a minute to find it. And while you're doing that, I will. I can read this, but it's pretty small. And I had it. Okay. I'll just remind the audience that you can put questions in the QA. And uh, the poets will answer them uh, at the end. So, did you find it, Anne? Yes, I did. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. I was right here all the time, of course. Summer Sanctuary. There's a distant rumble, hardly heard as we raked hay in the summer stillness. A sudden darkening veils the afternoon sun. Quickly it comes, pushing purple black clouds over the mountains and spiraling gray fog out of the valleys. We hurry to fork the last of the load onto the wagon. A roar of wind rattles the hay and bends the trees. We teach, we reach the barn. And 
and it does show the barn. We, re we reach the barn as the first drops glaze our faces. The huge loft surrounds us with a wrap of rain on the roof and the sweet, heavy smell of hay. Is that my time? Or? Yep, right on time. Thank you so much for your unique voice, Anne. And thank you all for all the poets. Um, it doesn't look like we have any poems, any uh, questions in the Q&A. And I just wanna double check that that's not because there's a problem with the Q&A. So um, what I'm gonna do is give people yes, a chance to raise their hand if they want. Yeah. So um, attendees should now be able to raise their hand if they wish to ask a question. And maybe they just don't have a question and that's okay too. Okay. I, ha I have a couple that are on mine. You, so have, a, you have some questions? Yeah. No, when the, Suzanne Rancott said, when screen, a screen occurs, we can't see each other. Did you get that? Yeah, that's the, that's the chat, not the Q&A. Oh. So oh, I, get, I guess what we'll do. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. So, um, so I guess we'll end there. And uh, everybody did such a nice job with their poems and also stayed on time. So thank you for that. Um, it's really been a treat to hear some of the other work from poets in the, in the project. Thank you so much for doing this. And, um, and I guess uh, I'll just remind everybody that uh, people who are in the audience will get a follow-up email that'll tell them where the recording will be and also how to, how to obtain the books of the people who read here today. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for doing this. And uh, it's been great to have you. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs>